when this show came about, it was meant to be boxers sitting across from me as I'm accustomed to. And when I had to adjust for the world's current condition and realize that there's a fighter in people that aren't boxers. And all of us, right. I have to confess that you weren't the first thought that came to mind. <laughs> I've been in almost one fist fight in my entire almost 50 years on Earth. And then it just hit me that, oh, because I was in the high 300s, 400 pound range, most people just assume I'd beat the ass and never mess with me. And then I told my trainer one day, I said, yo, I want to learn how to box just in case I have to. And he's looking at me like, what, one day you're going to cut the pillow tag off and get arrested and go to jail? Like, <laughs> that's what you... <laughs> it's like, Amir, I'm, I'm certain if you go to jail, it would be like for tax evasion. Like, you'll be in there with <laughs> federal inmates. Like, you won't ever... You will never know what Riker's eye looks like. I was like, nah, I just want to learn. Like, you know, how to defend myself. You know, it's... Uh, it's As a broadcast journalist, I've spent my life traveling the world and made my living interviewing the greatest fighters of all time. When boxing shut down, I finally had a chance to look around this world of conflict and could see the fight in everyone. Until this day, I talk to the greatest fighters and thinkers of our time about their fight. On Luminary, I'm Radio Raheem. Till this day. Today we start the first chapter in the book of the Roots founder, son of doo-wop singer Lee Andrews and the greatest hip-hop drummer of all time, Amir Thompson. You may know him as Questlove. Chapter one, find the opening. Parent adult mentalities was way different in the early 70s. The idea of a babysitter was five years before it's time. Let a stranger watch my kid. So I grew up with parents that were like, no, you're going to learn the craft. People were amazed. I'd run down my resume. When I was six, I was the family GPS. When I was nine, I was on wardrobe duty. I had to iron, steam, run stuff to the cleaners. When I was 11, I was the tech person. I knew how to set up monitors. Back in my day, back in 79, you could be a 12-year-old going to a nightclub, get there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You ask to see the manager, 12 years old. All right, I need a razor. I need some light gels. Okay, so I need uh, a ladder. And then I'd spend an hour cutting light gels, placing spotlights for my parents, and then I'd run the show. There wasn't, like, child labor laws or any of those things. As a 12-year-old, what are you telling yourself? If you're running the lights and the lights fuck up, well, it doesn't matter if you're 12 or 27, that's on you. I'm just dreaming of my Schwinn bike. See, <laughs> you work in the summer, you make $60 a night back in 1979, 1980. So, you know, do the inflation math. I was making about 280 to about almost $400 a week. Back when I was 12 and 13, that was my summer clothes money, my fall clothes budget, and the new bike I'm going to get. Did you feel a pressure to make them proud or at least to get their approval? There was a different pressure as his drummer because my dad's one of those people, if he was wrong, he's still right. When I was 12, my dad's drummer broke his arm, motorcycle accident, and then he was like, all right, well, you know the show. You're the band leader now at Radio City Music Hall. So this is where my discipline comes into play because my reputation for drumming is the space that I give. It's almost like, wow, it's what he doesn't play is so amazing. So the thing is, my dad, he just wanted it plain. In my mind, I'm thinking, I got to give him grandmom's Thanksgiving spread every night. And he's like, no, I want my regular peanut butter and jelly sandwich with the crust cut off, simple and plain, Whereas everyone has 30 seconds to prove to you they have the chops. So they come out the gate. <laughs> and, you know, a lesser person is like, wow. Which is why I would be amazed at a boxer that just comes out the gate. Whap, 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 whap. Whereas you're thinking, by round three, he's going to rope a dope himself and be tired. You don't have to put no spices on, no banana slices, no cinnamon, 
None of that stuff. Just give it to me straight up. And I couldn't understand that. I'm like, yo. And every night I'd wrestle with myself like, all right, here comes the bridge. I'm going to try this fill. And just pray to God he doesn't do this. He does a slight turnaround, looks at me in peripherals, and then he starts flashing. Five, 10, 15. So all of a sudden the price in my head's going from, okay, so instead of $150 for this gig, oh. I'm now at 135. He's docking your pay? He would just look. The audience wouldn't know. Sometimes the band wouldn't know. He would just left hand holding his microphone, right hand sort of up. And then if I did something he didn't like, he just flash five. And I get mad, but it kind of put me in a traumatized state that he just wants the pocket. He just wants the basic daily allowance. He doesn't want anything fancy schmancy. I'm actually glad he did that. And that's the problem because the thing was, at the time, I was going to a high school that was already adorned with well-known working celebrities. The future of jazz right now, they were all my high school. Christian McBride is regarded as the greatest living jazz bassist ever. Joey DeFrancesco, the greatest organist player. I mean, boys to men got their record deal in the 11th grade, so girls are already chasing them in the hallway at fourth period. Like, me and Tariq were the late bloomers of our high school. There was always also that need to, like, keep up with the Joneses and be extraordinary because every day it would be like, Hey, Chris, Joey, where are you going? Man, Miles Davis wants us to join him in Europe for, like, two weeks, so, you know, we'll, we'll be back in November. I was like, damn. Like, that's how life is every day. I could now tell the truth. It was all built on a lie. <laughs> it was built on a lie. All right, so the quickest way to this gargantuan story that should be a movie. Growing up in Philadelphia, there was a local dance show. It became national. It was called Dance Party USA. Yes. So, however, uh, in Philly, it was known as Dancing on Air. And there's two girls on the show that me and my boy were in love with. We were sophomores in high school, so we wrote the show every week. And then one day I got to meet my girl in the bank. You remember her name? Her name was Demika Reed. <laughs> That's true love. You remember her name? Yeah, Still I remember love her name. Her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I saw her in the bank one day. Yeah, I was the one that wrote you all the letters. Oh, that's so sweet. I still have your letters. Uh, his girl did not write him a letter. So I figured out a way to nuance the situation. At the time, my parents had me in this really nerdy college prep high school where I guess in their mind, they were like, we're going to raise, we're going to take these inner city kids and turn them into future Jeopardy contestants in Ivy League school. So I was like prepared to go that route. I knew that his girl attended high school at Performing Arts. So my whole plan was, yo, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask my mom and dad, yo, can I go to public school, please? I never went to public school. I wanted to be normal, like have jazz band class and, you know, all that stuff. And... I'm going to play wingman and hook my boy up with Melissa Savitor. I'm going to hook her up. So surprisingly, it worked. I got accepted high school creative and performing arts. So the first thing that I learned is that I got to get a school ID so that I can get free bus tokens to get to and from school. So I go to the principal's office. I'm sitting there to wait to take my photo, get my ID, get my tokens. Just out of some movie scene, the school guard is, like, pushing in this thug-ass kid with, by the ear, like, get in there. And his first line is, Man, you just fucking jealous because you can't get no pussy. And he sits down, and I'm like, what the fuck is this? So I'm hearing, overhearing, so basically, this freshman is about to get suspended for messing around with the girl in the bathroom, which is instantly about to make him a hero. And I'm just looking like, again, I came from a very, very sheltered showbiz family. I didn't go outside and play. I always did music. So I'm really just soaking in like what regular life is like. And like, this is my first public school. So I'm just wondering, amazing, like this guy, is, yo, he's about to get suspended for messing around with a girl in the bathroom. So he became an instant hero. I'm in line waiting for said tokens. And, like, the prettiest girl in school was, like, maybe six people ahead of me. And um, she's talking about Prince. So instantly, my antennas are like, Whoop! like, oh, I know about Prince. And I'm trying to figure out, like, how can I nuance my way into this conversation, whatever. So I don't know what I said, but 
I like corrected her. Like, no, uh, you, you mean, no, no that's, that's the, the B, B side. side. And she corrected me like, no, I'm, no, I'm t- no it's no, a no, version. No, no, no. No, because the thing is, like, we sampled it last night at the studio, but it's on the, the 12-inch version. And it was silence, and her and her four girlfriends were like, Morgan, who are you? Why are you running out of conversation? She's like, Sample what in the studio? I said, yeah, yeah, you know, worked on that song last night. I chopped it. What group? And I didn't think that deep into my life. Wait, you hadn't chopped it or sampled it? I didn't have a group. I said, yeah, me and him. I only chose him, Tariq, because Tariq was brilliant at playing the dozens, but he could also rhyme that shit. Playing the dozens is not just snapping on somebody, it's talking shit directly about their mother, which is the cardinal sin in the black community. So every day in lunch, he would just be like freestyling. i never seen someone just off the top of their heads talk about how bad your mustard stain is on your new polo shirt. And that was him. So cut to me running to him in sixth period, like right after lunch. One, seven, four. So, yo, if if anyone asks you, we're a group, okay? And he was like, okay. That was that. Like, I covered my lie. I figured I'd just have some insurance on my lie by making sure that I was there every day at lunch for fifth period. I was the dweeb guy, but I was allowed to sit with the cool kids because I knew how to do this. I wouldn't eat my lunch 45 minutes straight. On the lunch table, I was that guy. There's a very special episode of The Cosby Show that was a paradigm shift for every hip-hop producer. And that's the Stevie Wonder episode in which Stevie Wonder introduces the idea of sampling technology to the Huxtable kids. While visiting him in the studio, he gets each member of the Huxtable clan to say a certain word, and then he samples it and puts it behind a drum beat and gives them a cassette of it. You know, it's like 1985, so we all like... Yo, what's that, Mom and Dad? I want those things. So I got one of those samplers for Christmas. I take it to school, and now I can't drum on the desk anymore. I now have to run seven floors to the basement, play a real drum break, and then run upstairs. Okay. And then start playing my sampler with drums in it. And now Tariq's like a la carte in it. Like, no, I want you to play, um, play top billing. I was like, I got to run back to, yeah, man, go ahead, run, hurry up. Run back downstairs, try to play a perfect four bars of top billing in the sampler. <laughs> run back up. All right, do you got Big Daddy Kane Raw? I want to run the back. Ah, oh, man, come on. Lunch is almost over. But I was that guy all year. I was the beat provider for that table. And then cut to six years later. Like, we were group and name only. We just did, like, maybe one talent show. Tariq happens to ride me up to New York during my Juilliard audition. On the way back home, a girl sees me on the train. So I happen to sort of look like the kid in a Spike Lee Levi's commercial who was a bucket drummer. And she thought it was him. Like, yo, are you the kid in the, in the bucket drummer? It's like, nah. Next day, we're watching Soul Train, and that commercial comes on, and then the Eureka light hits us. Bing. We look at each other like, yo, why do we do that? Because the idea of busking playing on the streets was just a new concept, a new idea. We snuck out some pots and pans and buckets. We go to South Street, the cultural epicenter in Philadelphia, and we busk, and we made like 150. And it's like, whoa, 75, 75, that's date night money. You want to do this again next week? And next week we do it. I tell my boy, and he's like, leave the buckets on. Go get your real drums. Oh, man, my dad, my dad might start riffing. No, nah, man, I got a station wagon, you know. Sneak the drums out. And now it's like, oh, this is a thing. And we do it Week after week after week after week after week. And now gigs are coming in. Coffee shop chick is like, Yo, come to Temple University, my brother, and do, you know, our poetry slam. Club owners are coming up saying, yo. And this is back when Nirvana was still playing at J.C. Dobbs, playing local clubs. And now, like, wait, we can open for these guys now? In 1992, that's when the Roots were born. Someone's going to have to start organizing this. You got schedules. You have gigs to meet. Who's doing that function for the group? This is where my devious nature comes in. Because my dad's not feeling rap music. I'm listening to Public Enemy. So if he's turning the channel, looking for ESPN, and then he sees 12 seconds of two live crews, me so horny, 
you know, that that that's what you're into. I'm trying to Irish exit my way out of my dad's plans. I'm not trying to go to Juilliard. I'm trying to see what's up over here. He wants me to be the guy that Miles Davis pulls out of college to go drum for him. But it's like, nah, dad, I'm not trying to be the guy supporting Anita Baker. I'm trying to be Anita Baker. By this point, Tariq has to make a decision. If he's going to go to college, I have to make a decision. If I'm going to college, we do one last gig and it's a street gig. It's, uh, you know, we learned that summer that, oh, there's the esoteric Ivy League route. Play this guy's kegger, go to this guy's frat house. But there's also like a talent night for rap groups at this strip club called the Princess Lounge in North Philly. Pronounce N-O-R-F, where Jill Scott's from. North. North. Yeah. <laughs> North Philly. And so... We walk into the Prince's Lounge and, you know, we're, I'm hella esoteric. I'm wearing Birkenstocks, Oshkosh, but God, like, imagine like what, how TLC was dressing or Criss Cross was dressing. And at this point, you still haven't been beaten up? Nah. Here's the thing. Once De La Soul came out and MTV Raps was truly ubiquitous force in pop culture society, then cats around the way were like, oh, we get it now. You're one of them dudes. I also grew up in the crack 80s. So the worst thing that my parents could tell me was, I need you to go to the store to get some flour or we need toilet paper. It's like, fuck. Navigate your way. Through a war zone. Yes. You know exactly which alleyway to go through. If you got to go to a two-plot scenic route just to get to safety and back. That was my life then. And then De La Soul came out and it was like, oh, you cool. Whew. So that brought me 89 to 92. It brought me a pass as an adult, just to figure out where my lane was. So this last gig, we walk in looking like Arrested Development or PM Dorn or whatever, and they're just looking at us like, you're wearing Birkenstocks in North Philadelphia. And we set up and we play, and our first song and the whole club's like, yo. Just the novelty of watching somebody recreate in a Tribe Called Quest song in front of them, the novelty just knocked their... And one of the guys happened to be a local college radio DJ legend named AJ Shine, who then presents to us the idea of, yo, I want to record y'all. Let's do a 12-inch single. That 12-inch single winds up being an EP, which then winds up being 16-song record, which then winds up being kind of our demo. And within a year's time, we finally get a record deal. I didn't tell my dad about The Roots until our second album. Because by that point, you can't hide that you're in Rolling Stone magazine now. To him, it was like, ah, I wasted all that money trying to educate you. and You're supposed to be with Grover Washington Jr., a real job. You're supposed to be with Pat LaBelle, not rapping on stage, like holding your dick, like suck my dick, bitch. And then it like, flip, fifth. he was the parent that thought that rap was like, feel for him, feel for him. You know what I mean? He's not going to get this. And so by then... We had met our father figure. His name is Richard Nichols, who was a local jazz DJ on Temple's Jazz Station in Philadelphia. He kind of had a plan, which was, I'm going to market you guys as a jazz group that also knows hip-hop. Tariq is such a skilled hip-hop MC that it served us because people would underestimate us. Like, oh, you guys are like, what, like brand new heavies? Like, you guys aren't like Eric B and Rakim or whatever. Like, you're not real rap but we'll see what you guys got. Then when they were like, oh, you guys are actually good. We took advantage of lower expectations and being underestimated. And then we rise to the moment. Now, when you're doing these shows, are you using live instruments? Are you actually drumming? Nah, man. Like, yeah. Like, we want to be we want to be a Tribe Called Quest. We want to be De La Soul. Sampling other people's Sampling. live music. Or yeah. studio recording. That's what we're going to do. In my mind, I'm thinking... We'll be a real rap group in the studio. We'll find a DJ, and I'll drum on top of it, and we'll, quote, be a band that way. And my manager's like, no. Do the same shit that I saw you do on the street corner. Be a real band 100%. That's when he brings in his protege, Scott Storch. And now Scott Storch is our keyboard player, and he brings a bass player named Leonard Hubbard to the fold. So now we're a band. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've been late 
for an appointment or whatever and you run to a train platform, you're paying your fare and you run, 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 run and the train's pulling off. That was metaphorically the way to describe us missing the first wave of alternative hip hop. Radio Raheem here with Quest Love. Left in no man's land, Quest Love and Black Thought must find their roots. Chapter 2 Sprouted. We were going to sign to another label, and they misspelled all three of our names. Now, usually when you get a contract, your lawyer can cross it out and you just put an initial by the correct spelling of your name, right. and the contract's still good. But if all parties involved have misspelled names, right. and this is to the fault of the assistant who typed up the contracts, she lost her job, by the way. And the label's like, ah, okay, this is what we'll do. Destroy that. We'll send you a new contract. You guys will sign it Thursday night, overnight it to us, and then Friday we're good. She forgets to mail it on Thursday. So, ah, my bad. I'll send it on Friday. And then you'll, you know, we'll get it on Monday, and we're good. So that Friday... Our lawyer says, hey, by the way, there's a, a woman who just got her job. And Geffen Records is like, we want you to run our whole department. So she's looking for anything to sign. And she's heard about you guys and wants to see. Now, in our mind, we're like, yo, we're going to sign. Oh, this label. We're, we're good already. We're good. We were not going to sign to Geffen Records. All they had was Nirvana and Guns N' Roses. Like, they had no rap. And then we thought about it. Like, all year, they've been courting us. We've been getting free steak and lobster. My manager was like, yo, we're just going to do a horse and pony show. We just did it so that we can get more free steak and more free lobster. We were, like, ignorant back then, so it'd be like, we place our order, but then go to the bathroom and tell the waiter, like, yo, get two more steaks and, like, five more orders of king crab to go for, like, six sweet potato pies and just give it to us in the back. Like, you know, they get the bill, you know, but back then, it's like, oh, $2,000 bill? Eh, charge it. We just did it for the horse and pony show of it all. And to really be ignorant, my manager was like, let's pull a helmet. So side note, 1992 was also the year of grunge, Nirvana, Pearl Jam. You know, Seattle had an explosion of groups. So there's a band out of, I think, Portland or Seattle called Helmet. They signed a deal for a million dollars. And that became the rage of like, yo, a band getting a deal for a million dollars is never heard of. Like now it's like whatever. You know what I mean? Like Drake's boy could get four million, but back then you just didn't do that. And to put it in perspective, hip hop was the redheaded stepchild. Cypress Hill's first record was made for like 45000 in Vogue's Funky Divas was made for $2.5 million. Michael Jackson's Dangerous was made for $9 million. A Tribe Called Quest first record was like $100,000. De La Soul's Three Feet High and Rising was made for $25,000. I don't leave the house for that much. Like, life has changed now. That just shows you how they undercut hip-hop. So we got our steak dinner. We got our lobster to go. We're good money. So let's talk business. We was like, well, you know... We want two Pathfinders, one Land Cruiser, an SSL board, two MP360s, the Ribbon Royer microphones. We need five apartments. We did everything but a partridge and a pear tree. And she said, you know, let me think about it, whatever. Sunday night, our lawyer says, hey guys, I got news. What? She laughed at us? No, the opposite. Wait, she fell for that shit? Well, no, not quite. I actually added more on top of what you guys asked for. And? She took it. Wait a minute. What are you telling us? She agreed to the three cars, the five apartments, a complete studio setup. All my drum machines? Yeah. The microphones? Yeah. Everything? Yeah. And? You know, because we weren't even thinking of business. This is how dumb we were. I reduced it to just six records. They released the first records. They had to keep you for the second and third record. They released the fourth record. They got to do the fifth and sixth record. And then you're free to agent. We didn't know that, like, that's some Jay-Z shit. And it's like, what about our label? Well, up to you guys. Do you want to sign it? You think we should sign it? Like, we... Okay, we'll do it. Meanwhile, that guy's suicidal. He quit the business, oh, depressed and everything. God. We signed to the label, and... Um, so was it like we just hit the lotto and we're just celebrating? We or did, just yeah, we did, some ignorant, we did some ignorant-ass shit. There's a movie... Oh, Indecent Proposal. And... They got that half a million dollars and they swim in the money. They like lay in the money and all that right. stuff. Like, 
I had my ignorant Billy Jean moment where like I was walking down the block giving like homeless people a hundred bucks seeing like what it turned into a white tuxedo glowing in the dark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then I was broke by February. Like I'd spent like twenty thousand dollars. Like I brought every puma, everything. Like you couldn't tell me shit. It was just unprecedented because it's like the number one voted rap album of nineteen ninety was made for twenty five thousand bucks. We are signing for high six figures, like almost a million dollars. It was just unheard of. The first wave of alternative hip hop starts in 87 with the Jungle Brothers, and it ends in 1992 with Diggable Planets. So we're just, hold the door, hold the door, hold the and the train takes off. So we're on the platform, and the next train is Dr. Dre's The Chronic, which will change everything. Now, technically, Dr. Dre actually used live musicianship on The Chronic, but he introduces a world and ideas so grand that everybody says, I got to be derivative of The Chronic. So Biggie sees that and says, y'all got to make the East Coast version of that record. And then Nas sees Biggie win. It's like, yo, forget the Zillmatics. You know, keep it real shit. I got to do what Biggie did to win. Everybody is following. And now we're coming to the plate like, here we are. Now we're like a sore thumb because everybody is getting paid using a heavy gangster narrative. And we're the odd guy out because we're trying to infuse the ideas that we grew up on that were from 87 to 92. There was no place for us. Between December of 93 and March of 94, Geffen's three biggest moneymakers leave the label. Aerosmith decides we're going to go back to our first label, Columbia. Guns N' Roses is nowhere near a follow-up record to their last album in 1991. Right. So forget Guns N' Roses. And then April of 1994, my manager wakes me up. It's like, yo, we are I was like, what happened? He's like, you didn't hear the news? No. Nah. Kurt Cobain just committed suicide. Fuck. Wait, what does this mean? Yo, we're fucked. Well, what does that have to do with us? Dog, Aerosmith's gone. Guns N' Roses ain't making no money. And now Nirvana's done. Like, they're going to drop the black department before it even starts. So what do we do? I got a plan. So what we did was we exiled to Europe. We said, all right, there's 10 days left. We're going to knock out these eight songs. We're going to shoot three videos. And then we're going to pull a Whoopi Goldberg. Ghost. So cut to us in our best suits at the bank. Yes, we'd like to close out our account. And, you know, they're looking at us. You're Mr. da 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 Yes, we are. And they're looking, they slowly sign the check. That's our the remainder of our budget. And they hand it to us slowly. We take it, we walk out, and we know we got mere seconds. Hand it to our accountant, we cash it. We buy seven one-way tickets to London. <laughs> Wait, hold on, hold on. So you've done what you've been asked to it's do. It's our money, right. end quote. <laughs> but we stole it. But you're I, not supposed to use the rest of the budget. We're for supposed your to close the budget and say, and here's the album. We came in under budget. We had the feeling that they would take that remaining money and, like, okay, well, we have to now use this for marketing and buy these ads and get you publicists and da 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 da. And our shit was like, no, a bird in the hand beats two in the bush. What we're going to do is take the remaining 100000 we're going to just run away to London, get a flat, find an agent, find a tour bus. And we're just called Partridge Family, the shit out of Europe. You reverse beetled. Technically, we did a Hendrix. Yeah, oh, yes, there you go. <laughs> we did a Hendrix. Fair. We went over there and got an agent, got a smelly, pissy tour bus, and we spent maybe a month in every country in Western Europe. So we do a month in Italy at this rinky dink basement bar at this local, you know, whatever. And then we go to Germany, do the same thing, go to France, do the same thing. And, you know, the money's running out. We're living hand to mouth, living off of bread and French fries. And Geffen must know this is happening. With the casualness of when you might lost your car keys, 
Like, yeah. wait, well, I'm forgetting something. Wait a minute, where's the root? Like, literally, they forgot we existed. Where are the roots? And they called Wendy Goldstein live, like, where's the roots at? Where's our money? We told Wendy early what we were doing. She was more like, don't ask, don't tell. And Wendy was like, uh, let me see, guys. And she's calling, like, okay, the company knows they want to see something. And instantly, we got a publicist, too. And we said, show all the good press that we got in doing this. And it was that moment of asking for forgiveness instead of permission. Look, we went to Europe, and we got all this press. And they looked, and they were like, wait, you guys did this on your own? Y- yeah. And we're just like, okay, either they're going to press charges or we're going to get dropped. Or what the fuck? And they're like, oh, okay. Guess we'll put the album out in January. Whew. Okay, we still got a record deal. Meanwhile, what Rich predicted back in April did happen. They signed 12 acts. They dropped everybody but the Jizza and the Roots. So we came back and it was literally an uphill climb for two albums of trying to figure out how to get America's attention. But you were received better in Europe than you were at home. It made sense because here there's just no venue. If you think about it, like in 1993, the way that you're getting put it on is nepotism. Beanie Siegel's very first show in life is Madison Square Garden. With the exception of my situation with my dad, nobody's first show should be at Radio City Music Hall, and no one's last show should be at Madison Square Garden, like my story was. You know, you're supposed to work your way up. Aretha Franklin did 12 years in her father's church and slowly worked her way up to royalty. You couldn't see Brandy or Monica in some local club first before they got put on. Nepotism was how, you know, Snoop puts his boys on. Jay-Z puts his boys on. That was the new way of building acts, and hopefully they got a good single and traction, but also the fall off is faster. There's no honing a craft. We realized this on our third record, now in a panic situation because we got all this critical acclaim, and now we're about to make our fourth album, and we're still not catching on. And if it doesn't work on this fourth album, we're going to get dropped. So we came up with a plan. The plan was we're going to grow our own crops. And doing that was Friday night in my living room. We're going to have jam sessions. Label's now looking like, wait a minute, who's this Chef Terry and why is he on the budget? We said you can't have a jam session without free food. And you need good food to entice the music community that we want to attract. So as a result, an unknown, unproven Jill Scott is like, y'all having jam sessions in there? Can I come over? Okay. An unknown Kendrick, the family soul, is saying, yo, a homegirl from Atlanta sings, and, you know, that's in Diary. She comes up. The jam sessions got so big in my house that I worked hard to prevent the pizza delivery guy from getting on the microphone. Because now it's like, <laughs> wait, wait, anybody can just get it? Anybody can rock. Anybody can get in here now? Are we letting the pizza guy rock? Now, cut to two years later, Music Soul Child's the pizza guy. Bilal is this nine-year-old that is singing some gibberish like he's a weirdo and like is he singing music are these words are these, is he doing cat calls now on the microphone eve you know well she talked about her past we knew her as the stripper joined from the golden lady <laughs> she rhymes what's she doing here and literally i didn't know quali always makes this story that he got dropped off a of roots record I've heard that once or twice. Yeah. An unknown most, an unknown quality. Common would come by and Erica would come by and, you know, those things. But the silliest story of all is our boy telling us he has these rapping protégés who at the time were like, this 11-year-old girl is singing in my house. Jasmine Sullivan. We figured we'll build the story. And what happens is five hours on Friday, we're working on our craft and on our on our thing. And then Sunday nights, at Wetlands in New York, same thing. So from 1997 till 2000, this is happening like clockwork. 10 hours a week for these four years, and suddenly 14 record deals. Oh, you're really the epicenter of a culture that yes. you're describing now. Yeah. But do you recognize that up until this point, you're really counterculture in the sense that you're fighting the established way things are being done. At every stage, the way things are expected to be done. Right. You want to do them the opposite way. There's a culture and a counterculture. And you got to figure out which side of the swing is. The end of 97 being the, the, 
death of Tupac and Biggie, and Puffy sort of taking the baton from the two. With the rise of Bad Boy in 97, and then kind of the, the waning crash of Bad Boys was the shooting, the nightclub shooting, you know, the thing where Shine, him, J-Lo, at the tunnel, like his second album forever. It flopped. And there was like a backlash. And we took advantage of that backlash. It, w- it wasn't like we knew it was going to happen. But I think at that point, there was just so much of it happening. There was, there was a sect of people that wanted something different. And as a result, Erica's coming down the pipeline. D'Angelo's coming down the pipeline. And the thing is, we're, we're not doing it as a movement on purpose. Now, we, we all took a family photo in Vibe magazine. Most, Kwali, Dilla, Common, D'Angelo, Erica. We all took this photo together. You know, it was supposed to be like the announcement of a movement. And I realized then, if you look throughout history, whenever a moment happens, you look at Woodstock and you think, oh, this is the flag planting of peace, love, and understanding. And no, Woodstock is actually the end of the sentence. You look at Saturday Night Fever, 77. Oh, disco this is the moment. Flag planting. No. That's the end of disco. Michael Jackson's thriller. Oh, my God. For 10 years, he struggled to get to this point. Now he's the king of the world. Michael Jackson's here. Nope. That's the end of Michael Jackson. You even look politically. I'm sure that people thought, oh, Obama in the presidency. Like, we finally made it to the mountaintop, ladies and gentlemen. This is the beginning of post-racial America. We're here. No. Fucked around. It was the end of the sentence. So whenever something big and gargantuan happens in history, people tend to think of it as the beginning of the sentence. It was the end of the sentence. So when that photo was taken, suddenly everyone stopped coming to the jam sessions. We stopped calling each other. Chappelle's block party was such a wonderful captured moment in spirit. But that whole day, that was one of the saddest days of my life because I considered that movie my funeral. I didn't realize it. Until Kanye was the only one who wasn't there for the direct rehearsals. And he had to rehearse that morning. He wanted to do the Jesus Walk thing with the marching band and everything. Da, 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 da. So we were there for like two hours earlier rehearsing with everyone else and getting our thing together. But then he showed up and there was like a new burst of energy there. And the whole place came alive, like all the kids and everything. And then I was like, oh, shit, that used to be us back in, back in 1993. It's 10 years later. And then I was like oh, this is the end for us. And this is the beginning for him. And that whole day, I just felt very somber and sad about it. I I really want to preserve this moment because before this, we were spending the night at each other's cribs, working together, working on music. Electric Lady Studios was our hub. It was the end. We all split apart. We all stopped calling each other. I thought, this is it. This is the last stop of the train. Basically, from 2004 to 2008, I'm sort of operating in a, it's going to be over any moment. And I've had moments where, like, I've been really freaked out, like, Run DMC's opening for us. And it's like, yo, Tariq, man, you remember, like, when we went to the Fresh Fest and we all, everyone held up their Adidas sneakers and they sold out the Spectrum in Madison Square Garden? And it's like, yo, y'all sure Run DMC wants to open for us? I was seeing the first wave of successful rappers now deal with how to handle that where it's not about you anymore. And suddenly, you know, you might want to flex and let people know, hey, I'm still good. I still got it. I didn't want to get to that Vegas place. Right. When the Tonight Show offer occurred in 2008, I was a musical director by accident. After season three of The Chappelle Show implodes, Neil Brennan just happens to tell Jimmy Fallon, who's about to fill in Conan O'Brien's space, who's incidentally about to fill in Jay Leno's space, hey, uh, what should I do about musicians on my new late night show? Neil Brennan says, ask The Roots. They know all the best musicians. And Jimmy Fallon's like, exactly. I'll ask The Roots. He said, no, 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 no. They wouldn't consider it. Just ask the Roots. They know they know all the best musicians. Jimmy's like, yeah, I'm going to ask the Roots. Even the way that that happened 
was totally by mistake because I had just moved to L.A. My first day in L.A., I meet Jimmy Fallon. And I already know, I'm not going to take this offer, but I'll invite you to the show and we'll sit at the table, we'll talk, and we'll politely decline. But I at least want to be your friend so that way when it's time to release a record, I can still come on the show and be in good stand and whatever. And um, he comes to the show and the weirdest shit happens. Uh, I go away for 20 minutes and Jimmy is doing a Bring It On-esque human pyramid with the rest of the roots. But the thing that made it even deeper was Tariq was on the bottom row. So my first thought is, wait, Tariq is getting his Japanese denim dirty on the football field in this human pyramid. And I look at my manager and we're like, we are not getting rid of Jimmy Fallon. And he was so persistent, so persistent and said, dude, you know, come on guys, you can be with your families. And then we thought about it like, oh, we could be with our families. In my mind, again, in that block party mentality, I said, this is a dignified way to die. We're going to do eight minutes of music a week. It's going to be the same amount of pay as doing 275 shows a year. Nobody's kid's going to be crying in the airport. Daddy, don't go. You know, we're going to, <laughs> to, to Australia for three weeks. You know, because now their kids are like seven, eight years old. They're missing soccer practice and all this stuff. Right. So now we could be home. I can finally have a long-term girlfriend and not have her lose her mind and, you know, all that stuff. So that's why we took the show. I didn't once think that this is going to be a second chance or a new breath of life for us. But what I didn't want was to have that moment where I'm at my funeral again. 2009 to now, I'm saying yes to everything. Radio Rahim here with Quest Love. point in the fight, when the jab starts working and you find the right hand, you begin dictating the pace. Quest Love is about to find both hands working, and his footwork's not bad either. Chapter 3, Yes Man. There was a, a window of opportunity that I had to grab. So write a book? Yeah, I'll do it. Teach NYU? Yeah, I'll do it. Open my own hoodie store? Yeah, I'll do it. Oh, wait, I can have my own radio show? Yeah, I'll do it. Oh, and a podcast too? Yeah, I'll do it. Run this website? Yeah, I'll do it. Score this movie? Yeah, I'll do it. Amy Schumer, you want me to work with you? Great. Yeah, I'll do it. So there was a point where I had literally 19 jobs. I got Hamilton by accident. I went to Hamilton thinking it was another play I was working on. And now my manager's like, dude, we're now doing two Broadway plays. Oh, I didn't know. Someone gave me tickets to Hamilton just to see how a play is run so that we could develop a play. Now I'm 19 jobs in. That didn't serve me either. So now I did the opposite of 2004. I'm now on that Mario Brothers board with all the free gold coins, <laughs> grabbing all the shit I can. And my life coach was like, your personal life's in shambles. You're a mess. So we need to drop 10 of these gigs. No, I can't because I'm afraid to, you know, what if I go broken? Da, da, da. By the end of December, I had to drop 10 of these things. I had to go through each of them and figure out what do I really need? Like, do I really want to do this or am I just saying yes to everything? At the top of the year, I drop 10 of these gigs and just keep the nine that are passionate to me. And then fate sort of stepped in and then really had a laugh once quarantining started and just knocked me down a zero which is basically the best thing ever because I thought if I stop, I'll be back in my dad's house broke. You know, and I see rappers on Instagram like, I'll sell a verse for 500 bucks. I didn't want to be that person. And what's weird is that all this time off has actually opened way more doors than any amount of planning. Once I stopped and sat silent, now my dreams are starting to happen. Let me tell you a story. The first time I ever saw you perform, Mm -hmm. so, well, I wasn't backstage and have all access passes, didn't show up with anybody famous. I went to see the guy that people were telling me is this amazing drummer. I didn't know the roots. I confess that. Oh, my God. I'm sitting here like, wait, who? Who are you talking to? I didn't realize. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, damn. I just told on myself. I went to see bands perform. I was like, I'm not going to see a DJ and an MC. That's what the record's for. I want to see a show. And so House of Blues. This drummer, this drummer, this drummer, this drummer. You got to go see this. Quest, to this day, 
It's the best hip hop show I've ever seen. I've never seen any hip hop artist. Cut to me running out the door right now. <laughs> with a full band doing their songs. That band element is what made it different, what made it unique, what made it the best I'd ever seen. The only reason I was there is because this drummer everyone was talking about. I can see a silhouette of you, and everybody knows who that is. But in your mind, and the way you're telling it to me, makes me feel like you don't recognize that you're driving these narratives. I'm learning the greatest lesson of my life. We all have this thing where, man, like, cancel 2020. But then it's like 2020 is the most transformative year of my life because even now, as you said those words, there's a still a chip in me. It's sort of like, oh, no, don't say that. Don't say that. Please don't say that. It's going to take another six months to a year to own those things because for me to really be comfortable in my own skin, I was raised with a false modesty or humbleness. I mean, in the best case scenario, you have to unlearn maybe 50% of what your parents have taught you, probably 80%. In the beginning, you're taught to not be fool yourself or conceited or narcissistic. And so I always looked at Jay, him owning his kingdom. You look at Kanye, him owning his kingdom. You look at Diddy, him owning his kingdom. I always thought that was a bad thing. I thought that's evil. It's taken me a long time to sit with my thoughts and learn that, oh, I should know who I am and what I represent. Here's the funny thing about it. In a meta way, sounding like an amateur got me where I am, which is <laughs> weird. You know, as I said, it took us four records to hit pay dirt. So that first record, when it didn't work, there was kind of an invisible finger pointed at me. Well, you guys don't sound like real hip hop. You sound like a band. It's the drummer's fault. So then there was a chip on my shoulder. And for the second and third record, I was like, all right. I trained myself to be the most meticulous, lifeless, coldest human ever. I was so meticulously quantized. Like, is that a drum machine? Is that a sample? That's not a human being playing that. So what really made this thing legit was my pairing with both D'Angelo and Jay Dilla. Jay Dilla is a, is a figurehead who, next to Prince, is the only one that even cared to even try to make drum machines sound human. Usually when people get a drum machine, they treat it as an over-glorified metronome. Something to keep time. One minute just to program something, and then it's an afterthought. Whereas these two guys actually put a lot of thought into, hey, on bar 63, I'm going to do a drum roll here. Whereas Dilla will take it even further and program it sloppy as a drummer would. I'm going to speed up slightly here and then slow down here. So there's a human element that's so obvious to it. When I started playing with D'Angelo, in two months, D'Angelo forced me to unlearn everything I ever learned about drums and was like, I want you to play like a drunk three-year-old. Think of like a three-year-old that takes like two swigs of Patron. <laughs> that's how I want you to sound. And it created a synergy so dope because he's doing it too. And all the other musicians are doing it too. That it's like, oh, okay, there's, there's strength in numbers. And now all these drummers that were like taking my gigs, you know, the drummer of the year, modern drummer for five years in a row. Da, 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 this guy was like, yo, man, that you're unorthodox pocket style. I like it. And now I hear them trying to do it. And I'm like mind blown. Like, wait a minute. My dad's been forced me in that rat infested, mildew infested, cockroach spider webs crowned down my back basement summer after summer after summer after five hours a day for like 10 years. Like I'm breaking my neck to sound like you guys and now all of you are lining up. And I'm not just like my peers, like my idols too. Yo, man, you have such a deep pocket. I'm like, yo, I practiced to your records all my childhood. And now you're saying like, what? He's like, yeah, man, it's just, I want to play like you. And I can't fathom that 
something as carefree and thoughtless as what I'm doing is now like a thing. That's the irony of it all is that I made my mark not caring. Well, in your case, it's not the lack of care or concern. It's the ability to be free. With amazing creative genius is a polar opposite of a lot of self-work that often gets neglected. Much to my detriment, I'll say that a big part of my life was just the caretaking and the neglecting myself. You know, my health was bad. I was living off of three hours of sleep a day. Like, I thought that was honorable. I work on this record for 10 hours, and I'll take a nap for two hours, and then I'll go and work 13 hours on this record, and then I might go to the hotel and shower. But no, then I'll go to the studio scene, da 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 So you do that for 17 years. You can't explain why you suddenly have, like, lymphedema in your body and all the swelling starts. And, you know, at the time, I just thought, like, oh, well, guess I gained all this weight or whatever. Like, you know, these past eight years living in this dungeon, working 24 hours around the clock. And my life in touring is three-hour root shows and then four-hour DJ gigs. And then lobby calls always 6 a.m. We're always on the first thing smoking. Next city, five-hour flight, next country, sound check for three hours, three-hour root show, four-hour DJ gig. For 20 years, that wear and tear and abuse, no sleep, no health regimen, no exercising, whatever, I just became a mess. Creatively, I was great. But for me, it was about sacrificing for the greater good of the art and that thing. And I thought that was honorable. But really, I think it was just providing more distractions. Now, once all these things were taken away, March of 2020, I had to just sit alone and just be me. And that's when I decided, like, okay, well, I'm either going to thrive or I'm going to drown. So what do I want out of life? It took me maybe eight weeks to realize, like, oh, shit, I'm programmed to not even know how to dream. Yeah, I did wrestle with that a lot. Just dressing bummy and doing anything to throw off the smell that I'm doing well as a performative way to show people, like, you're still down and you're not selling yourself out. I just, you know, just coming to grips with it now in this year. Was it a struggle to keep people around you in your real life that weren't performers, that weren't exceptional? Was it hard to stay with people who weren't in that world? And that's the thing I kind of, you know, said with pride, like, back in the day, like, I don't got no friends. Which, if you took away girls I was dating, people on payroll, and people related to me uh, in my immediate bloodline, so basically my mother and my sister. Those were the three people in my life. My mother, my sister, family, which no offense to anyone else in my family, but kind of the first people that you lose in the situation is other family members. So, you know, most people I block on Facebook are cousins. Girls I date, in my mind, it's like, okay, this is who one of you is going to get old and die with me. And then people I work with. Employees can't be your friends. And I learned that lesson too. I'm the boss that, like, wants to be everybody's friend. And da, 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 da. That's a disaster. Don't want to, oh, God, we got to let this guy go. And I'm the only guy that keeps people on payroll after I let them go. I'm the worst boss ever. There was no person in my life who wasn't on payroll or who wasn't related to me or in the running to be Mrs. Amir Thompson. There was literally no one else. I need a starting five. Every human being should have their starting five. Who are the other four people in your life that are wise people that have nothing to do with your profession? And it's hard as shit to have people in my life that I'm not responsible for that actually have their own lives. With all this self-actualization, you got your starting five now. How much reaching back are you doing over things that you missed while running so hard with blinders on and facilitating so many other people and now at this stage in life, realizing the things along the way that you didn't do for yourself. Me and my mother, me and my sister, 
me and Tariq had our first meaningful rounds of conversations in 30 years. It's different when you run a business with someone. And it got to the point where the jokes were cute, like his tour bus is Slytherin and my tour bus was Gryffindor. <laughs> we did a gig once with the, the Chili Peppers back in 2005. We're in Italy. We're in a big-ass soccer stadium, 90,000 fans. We're at the side of the stage watching the show. And I'm noticing every four songs, these guys get in the football hut, arms around each other. You can't hear what the microphones are saying, but that's the third time they do it on the show. I was like, strange. So next city, I'm asking Flea. Flea, what do y'all keep doing in those huddles? Are you calling audibles? Are you doing a new song or something? Are you going over something? I've never seen that before. Nah, man, we're just, this is a raggedy band from Los Angeles. We're really grateful. We're showing gratitude. Wait, what? Yeah, man. We're in front of 90,000 people who don't speak the language that know every line of Californication. You're having this conversation on stage? Yeah, man, we just want to be grateful in the moment. I was like, oh. So I get back on the tour bus, and I'm my manager. I'm like, yo, man, this is motherfuckers just being happy on stage and being happy to have each other and have the experience. And I was like, that shit is crazy, right? And my manager's like, that sounds about right. I was like, you don't, I was like, you don't think that's weird? Well, they actually like each other. I was like, oh. I said, whoa, whoa, wait, what? And he's like, they actually like each other. I was like, what's that supposed to mean? He's like, what? Oh, y'all? <laughs> y'all don't like each other. We've been together for 19 years now? Yeah, but y'all don't like each other. When's the last time Tariq slept on the couch at your crib while you worked on music? Dude, Tariq ain't been to your house since 1994. It's like it's 2007. Dude, you have two different tour buses. Y'all come to sound check. He might come to sound check. You might not come to sound check. After the show, you go DJ at some nightclub. You show up in the next city, and y'all do the same shit over again. It's like it's cool, but y'all don't like each other. They actually like each other, and it shows. This is what happens when you like each other. All right, maybe we should have like Sunday dinners at each other's house or something like that. So it was like awkward because we were like best friends. And we built this thing, and this thing became really big, and then we just became two islands that just came together for the good of the business. Everything I do is behind a shield. DJing, shields, turntables. I'm behind a drum set. I'm behind Jimmy Fallon. I'm behind Tariq. All shields to come out and be a talking head. I've avoided that kind of leadership thing for decades. I learned now to accept that I really have to stop this red box driving, old Navy t-shirt rocking, reluctant leader shtick that I've been playing for the last 30 years. The amount of times the Obama administration was like, we need you to be a talking, you know, to give talking points and a voice. To the, Wait, y'all want me to do a speech? Again, the fear of, I don't know how to do that shit. No, no, no. Projects that I've been offered that I said no to immediately that I should have did. I mean, as a result, my manager's like, no, I'm not letting you weasel your way out of this. You're directing this movie. I don't know. I didn't go to film school. No, no, no. And now it's like, literally, I've been directing the documentary of my dreams for the last three years. A month before Woodstock happened in 1969, there was a black version of Woodstock that happened in Harlem for 300,000 people. All the acts of the day, Stevie Wonder, Staple Singers, Sly and the Family Stone, David Ruffin, The Temptations, B.B. King, Roy Ayers, The Chambers Brothers, The Fifth Dimension, Nina Simone, just all the acts of the day. 50 hours captured on tape. Nobody cared. It sat in someone's basement for 50 years and almost went in the trash because the ex-wife was like, oh, I don't have no use for it. Throw it away. And then someone comes to me and is like, you're our guy. You know music. You love music. It's in your DNA. You direct it. You know, in the beginning, I thought it was going to be like me nerding out on performances and music. But the story of... 
this Harlem Cultural Festival is really what we are going through now. And it really didn't start resonating until Black Lives Matter. It's what's happening now, but 50 years ago. You're a giant. I don't mean just in stature. I mean, you are a powerhouse. And Thank you're you. an unassuming energy. I'm learning to accept these compliments. Thank That's you. That's <laughs> genuinely infectious. Okay, it's stop a good with the compliments, room. man. It's a good room that, that you create. What does Amir mean? It means prince. In one of the weirdest times of my life, I was working on Common's Electric Circus record, and one night the receptionist calls uh, Studios A that we were in. It says, uh, Amir, Prince is on the line for you? And normally when Prince wants you, someone else calls, and the pronouns are weird. Like, he'll speak to you momentarily. And you already know, like, oh, it's Prince. Like, that sort of thing. And he gets on the phone. He says, hey, what's up, Prince? I was like, huh? You know what your name means, right? I was like, yeah. It's like, what's up, Prince? I said, not bad. I said, wait, am I allowed <laughs> to call you? This is back in 2003. Right. I said, am I allowed to call you that? Oh, uh, he was a like, symbol. He's like, yeah, you know. He's like, brothers still call me Prince. I said, oh, good. Said, not bad, Prince. Later found out he named his son Amir. Amir only made it for 10 days, but they named him Amir. I never knew that. And I was just like, wow, it's crazy. One time he sang my name in Sign of the Times instead of having a baby calling him Nate. He looked at me and was like, let's fall in love, get married, have a baby. We'll call him Amir. And I was like, oh, wow, that's so cool. And what does Khalid mean? Um, I think it means leader. Or you know what it means. <laughs> it also means gift from God. I'll take that too. The first part of your life was very Amir. You were the prince. You were reluctant to sit in that throne. Very reluctant, yes. And now you've met your Khalid moment. Yes. And this is the moment where you take the throne. Thank you. This this might be one of the best podcasts I've ever done, where you force me to face face the mirror. That That's what it should be, where I have to deal with... This is almost like therapy. <laughs> it's crazy. Appreciate it. Amir Khalid. Thank you. Amir Khalid Thompson, hailing from the famed fight town, Philly, PA, currently fighting out of New York, New York, standing at a towering six feet, two inches, fighting at heavyweight. Quest Love. To this day, Radio Raheem. To This Day is a Luminary original podcast. It's produced by Pilot Boy and Alex Kaznoff for Salt Audio. Executive produced by Dave Chappelle and me, Radio Raheem. Most importantly, I'd like to thank my mom. You may know her as Dr. Rita Muhammad, without whom none of this is possible. Original audio production, music and sound design by Salt. Executive produced by Pilot Boy. Executive produced by Noah Gosh, Jamie Sheffman, Nick Panama, and Kenzie Wilbur. Creative producer, Alex Kaznov. Executive producer, Elliot O'Day. Head of production, Liz LeMay. Head of engineering, Jordan Galvin. Production manager, Ali Strobel. Post coordinator, Alice Byrne. Edited by Jeffrey Muchnick. Mixed by Salt. Additional editing and sound design by Jasper Van Dyke and Noah Kowalski. 